uh, giving this talk in this uh, symposium. So I will present today uh, a view of uh, spinning organs evolution. Um, and, and this is this is uh, especially an invitation after after the important work of, of Murphy and Roberts uh, on spider systematics, especially on, on the overview of the families. If you see in this uh, the drawings of this book, they even put in the title uh, under spinnerets, and they place a lot of emphasis in in drawing uh, Spigot's diversity, which is a extremely useful resource. Uh, for us to do systematics over, over the whole diversity of spiders. I'm, I'm kind of fond of, of spigots because it's, it's probably the most beautiful and, and biologically meaningful character systems across all spider. Uh, it has a lot of variation. It has lots of uh, relations with the biology, the foraging, the behavior, the development. And there are multiple uh, important aspects of the life of a spider that is mediating, mediated by silk. Uh, this, this work, um, talking about women, this has grown over the pioneering work which I, I, I like to emphasize of Jacqueline Cobor from France, uh, Hans Peters from Germany. They made so beautiful research on spigots and gland morphology and the functional aspects. And this has been quickly translated uh, into systematics, especially by Coddington, Platnick, Griswold, and collaborators. So today, uh, if we talk about uh, systematics, we are very much into spigots. This is a, just a small example of how papers today include spigot morphology in systematics. So this is how I work. This is a scanning electron microscope. Uh, we produce excellent and very nice uh, images of spigots. It's not the only way of studying uh, for instance, Murphy and Roberts, they, they use these uh, beautiful drawings made with very uh, kind of something that you could do at home, like expansion in lactic acid over an excavated slice and then regular microscopes. And they did pretty well. This is the same spiders, um, right, examined by them, uh, left by me. And of course, SEM is much, much better, but still they managed to see uh, very nice uh, diversity of spigots and confirming what everybody else was looking in the electron microscope pretty much. What I will show you today is it's a quick overview of spinning organ evolution uh, in the light of, of the recent phylogenies that have changed a little bit uh, from previous ones. And, and then I will focus on some interesting characters. Well, interesting to me, but that are biologically meaningful because it's too much to, to give a, a full review today. Uh, this is what I prepared to show you. Uh, I built a data matrix based on my study on Dionicans and then the intelligence, the RNO, is this classic work on spigot morphology. The book, of course, I uh, use a lot as a, as a source. And, and then our own image collection for the ATOL project and my lab. This is a work in progress. Uh, many people will be involved. It's 129 characters so far, but there will be more. And the trees we are presenting today, it's mainly a, a summary uh, made from transcriptomic, uh, phylogenomic and Sanger sequencing plus other stuff like many, many sources. Uh, there will be an appropriate analysis for a publication, but that's in the pipeline. Well, the tree is kind of big. Uh, my, the matrix is almost five, like 400 species, but I'm planning because many of those are kind of the same. So there is 200 and something in this screen. Uh, and I painted in colors, the main clades that I will try to maintain when, when I talk of, of groups. Uh, these are the main groups. 
And sometimes they are not the most interesting. Sometimes uh, the most interesting group are like in between these smaller, smaller plates that are painted in, in gray and document the interesting trans transitions sometimes. So to begin with, these are the first record of spigots uh, in some kind of arachnid, uh, probably related to spiders. Uh, and they have these spigots that are the, the outlets of the silk glands. Uh, discovered by Selden and co-workers. It's a beautiful preserved cuticle piece. And it looks like the, the spigots were not in spinnerets, but in some kind of uh, ventral plate, perhaps. Um, we are waiting to see a complete fossil of this. Uh, it will be very nice. Uh, this is the most astonishing finding of the recent times on fossils. This is Chimera Acne. Um, these beautiful fossils in, in, in amber look something that is quite much of a, of a spider, but it has a telson. And the spinnerets are like in its full glory. Um, it's uh, amazing. And this, this is, in all lights, the sister group of spiders. And if you see the primitive spiders are pretty much the same in morphology, they have these uh, long spinnerets, multi-articulated. Um, these are uh, fossils in amber that Wunderlich uh, found of mesothelids, uh, or mesothelids, because we don't have apomorphies for those. Uh, this is, these are living uh, lephistius. And what is interesting here is that if you see the spinnerets of these fossils, they are all at, at the end of at the abdomen, like the araniomorphs and the mygalomorphs. So this development of the spigot of the spinnerets going advanced in the middle of the abdomen, it has to be a derived acquisition of the modern lifistids. This is something that Wunderlich uh, proposed a few years ago, and he was very much right as oftentimes with Wunderlich. This is a mapping of the anterior lateral spinnerets, um, usually absent in many, many mygalomorphs. And I showed you this because the new phylogenies are very eloquent in, in that the, the most basal clades of mygalomorphs, they all had uh, anterior lateral uh, spinnerets. So those must have been uh, secondary losses. And at least four in this tree, perhaps many more, when one evaluates all the exathelids, uh, and et etc. So how, how can it be that things that are advanced here will retain six spinnerets and not losing them? Perhaps the answer is has to do with ontogeny. Um, at least three papers have been accumulating of spiders, which adults have four spinnerets only, but the early spiderlings, this is Antrudiatus by Jason Bond and, and Coyle, uh, they have these small spinnerets here and here. Actinopus by Marielena Galliano and Pablo Golovov. Here, small spinnerets, relictual with a spigot, and then the pleura as well. The pleura is very much nested inside my galamorph. So perhaps this is a pattern that is much more common than we, we think about. There is, of course, if you go from the basal lephistiomorphs, my galamorphs, they have usually the same kind of spigots or a little bit of variation. I will talk about that later. But what happened later in the araniomorphs is that it was a lot of uh, evolutionary no novelties. I think it was via the individuation of sun spigots that are uh, homologous in, in function in morphology and also in a specific place of the spigot, of the spinneret. So look, this anapid, they have the major ampullates here, the minor ampullates, the cylindricals, the aggregates, the flagelliforms, they are in, a, in specific locations in the spinnerets. 
Let's go to one of these systems, uh, one of the most functional and meaningful. This is the ampullate plus piriform system. The piriforms make the glue and fibers of the attachment disc, and the ampullates make this pair of fibers making a cable, one of each spigot, uh, one spigot on each spinneret. They come as two, attach, and go out. And this is a uh, a very resistant cable and attachment device that is essential for the aerial webs. Jonas Wolf has made some beautiful work on the precise choreography that this, the, the spinners have to do to build such uh, the attachment discs. And he shown that the morphology of the of spinnerets the quality of the fibers and the choreography of, this, of the spinnerets will determine the physical performance of the attachment disc. Keeping this in mind, uh, one wonders what happened in the basal araniomorphs that instead of having this peculiar single or pair of ampullate spigots in the margin, they have more than two and sometimes disperse with other spigots. So these are the attachment discs of uh, philistatids. It's pretty much disorganized. And, and the drag line is a bunch of fibers um, of diverse diameter corresponding to, to the six ampullates participating. So this has to work different from, from the regular araniomorph drag line. And well, some open question is what happened with the, the most basal animals that have many, many ampullates. Uh, look at this. This is the, the mapping of the many ampullate gland spigots across spiders in blue and the reductions to two or more. There are one, two, three, four, like 12 reductions independent in the tree of life of spiders. How could that happen? Ontogenic again helps with this. These are early stage of hypochylus. Two spigots here, many in the adult. This is Philistata, the same one here, several in the adult. And small Philistatids are, this is the adult, are kind of the same of spiderling. So I think it's something to do with. Uh, an ontogenetic truncation of development. So what is helping these uh, convergences? I think there are two processes here. One is ontogenetic change is easing uh, the way of having only, only one or two ampullates. And then of course, there must be a strong, posit a strong selection for very thin cables that are easier to manipulate those reductions. This is another system of, of the independent evolution of sticky silk. Like in the tree of life of spiders, there are at least five ways of having sticky silk to, to capture prey. The cribellum, the, the loxosceles system, the phosphates, the arneoids, and the nephosites. This is of course the most famous, the cribellar nine of fibers. Uh, coming in the like a macro scale choreography. And then there is this micro scale choreography for building the cribbled band. Uh, and Christine Joel has worked a lot on this, uh, documenting the, the, the choreography of the spigots and the spinnerets doing this, which is very important to the end product. And this is work by Dakota Pjorkowski. He has done beautiful work on the resistance on of the silk as the coils inside uh, progressively uncoil and broke and produce a particular physical performance. We did the same with uh, Progadungula with Peter Michalik and Dakota as well. It was a very nice thing to do. These are the coils that will change structure as, as, as the band will stretch. classical uh, multi-conversion into something else. Uh, if you put the cribellum as primitive, 
there are in this tree at least 32 losses and there should be many many more because maronoids they have species in the same genus with and without crivellum so this is uh, very nice is the ideal for comparative biology the second case of sticky seals of course the the aggregate this is silk and this is an invention of araneoids and with many losses inside i have just a few because this is a, a small data set for araneoids the third sticky silk is uh, loxoceles they do all the web with two spigots this and the other on the opposite side they do this flat ribbon and what is astonishing is looking at high speed how they spin uh, this flat ribbon with the participation of of pincers in the posterior spinnerets uh, that grab the silk and they do something that is a, a miracle. The fourth case, uh, the sticky silk of falsets, it's made in a totally different way. It's a piriform spigot, huge shaft here, and they make something similar like droplets that are sticky, uh, similar in function like araneoids, but with a totally different gland. And at the end, the gnaphosids, one of the favorite cases to me, they have these huge piriforms here. One would say what they do with that. And Jonas Wolf discovered what they do, and they attack prey with, a, with a special piriform fibers. Uh, it's only used for very dangerous prey, like other spiders, and it's like a sticky tape uh, made with these huge spigots. So with this, uh, I will show you a little bit of a few and ongoing topics that I think are key to the progress of what we're doing in, in diversity and phylogeny. Um, one of the favorites to me, like if we, we think what to do next is understanding what's going on in mygalomorphs because they have different glands. Uh, they are not individuated in regular positions. And this is, for instance, the mapping of pankiniform spigots after the war by Golubov, who retrieved a PhD thesis by Jacqueline Palmer. And if you see this, it's mostly missing entries and places, placing the pankiniforms everywhere in the tree. So I think we don't understand what's going on with these spigots. Perhaps looking at the glands will help. This is another image from, from Golovov, a pignothelid. And look at this image. There are at least three kinds of spigots here. A small one, a big one, and the pumpkiniform here, perhaps. So there is something going on on my galomorphs that we, don't, we do not understand well. And it would be nice to trace, to trace the origin of spigot types that we know so well in our animals. Uh, far back in the in the evolution, as far as we can, to mygalomorphs and nephistomorphs. This is another ongoing development, which is well, I admire so much this work by Mark Townley and Edward Tillingast. They discovered this mechanism of of that allowed the spiders to spin while while they are molding. You know, a mold is a rigid, inert. Uh, uh, thing in the outside of the spider, and they will they want to keep spinning while molting. So the way they do that is this is the molting spigot, and there is a duct here. So the duct here is going through the new cuticle. So this is functional while the spider is molting, and so they have this complex mechanism of alternating functional and non-functional glands uh, with this tartipore accommodated system, which is a miracle of nature. Um, they have traced individual glands in the development uh, of arneus, mimetus, etc. And while doing this, they, they discover that there are specific glands that will, are accommodated or not in, in the tartipore system. So they look the same to us, but they have different developmental behavior. And it's something very interesting to, to look at. If we trace the origin of tartipores, 
Uh, this is a lithiomorph they don't have. This is a mygalomorph. They do have these turkey pores here, the, these little scars. So I think that the origin is in Opistothelis, uh, mygalomorphs plus lithiomorphs, but it was lost here in since permeata plus hypochelids and telestatids. So one wonders why they would get rid of, of such a beautiful innovation. That's uh, something to, to think about what they do when they are molding. Perhaps they cannot uh, do other stuff, do stuff that other spiders do. A second thing that we have to go back and connect again is morphology and diversity of glands because uh, most of what we know is based on sections and the gross morphology as Milan Resak and Jonas Wolf were showing uh, there is an impressive diversity that it will be very nice to connect to what we know about spigots and evolution. So to conclude this, um, give a little bit of time for question. Uh, this is a fascinating organ system and it's full of evolutionary novelties. And we have a lot of data. It's very informative for phylogeny and it's very informative for evolution behavior and there are a lot of things still to learn from multiple perspectives. It's not only morphology, as I was looking at behavior, and it's how they make uh, their living, uh, the choreography, the muscles. And with this, I will close uh, thanking for the invitation again. Um, thank you to a lot of people that have helped uh, and contributed with the data. I was just showing a little bit. Uh, or these and many others. And hopefully they will become collaborators for a complete study on this.